Hi, my name is Carrie Ray Barnum. I am the Executive Director of New Shelves Books, and we are here for Free Advice Friday, the hour every Friday where we get together to talk about book marketing, publishing, anything that's trending in our industry. We are open for questions. You can join us at newshelves.com slash FAF, or you can email your questions in to info, I-N-F-O, at newshelves.com, and we answer those questions on Friday. A replay goes up on YouTube on Monday. That's just youtube.com slash newshelvesbooks. We've got our friends live here asking questions. I've got a couple emailed questions in this week, so we are going to jump in. The first question we have is, who would you suggest for a publisher that would be appropriate for an art illustrated book? Um, Sarah, if you're asking who you can pitch for an art illustrated book, you would need to do some research specifically on what type of art. Um, typically, publishers who are really focused in on that industry will have niches. So is it uh, a coffee table book? Is it something that is very artistic and then working from that and pitching directly? That is the type of publisher that you probably can pitch directly. Of course, having an agent always helps, but if you're trying to pitch that for a publisher, you probably could directly. So you really want to do some research because it's more of a niche category and go from there. And the question we had in our Free Advice Friday Facebook group was, is it true that if you email publishers or agents on uh, Monday or Friday that your email doesn't get looked at? Well, not really. Your email will probably get looked at if you send on a Monday or a Friday. However, it is less likely to be given longer consideration. People on Monday are coming into a full inbox. It is not unusual for my inbox to have more than 300 emails. 300 emails when I come back, if I stop looking at emails on Friday afternoon, when I come back on Monday to have 300 or so emails. Agents, publishers are the same, if not even more high volume. So if you are sending on a Monday, you're just part of a big pile and they are skimming through and going through as quickly as possible. So they'll probably look at your email, but they're not gonna spend much time on it because they're trying to clear their inbox. Likewise, if it's a Friday, they are trying to get done their task list so they can get out of there and they can go enjoy their weekend just like you are. So Fridays is also not a good day. If you are trying to send out pitches or queries or you are trying to get a response from someone, the best time to send out emails is going to be your Tuesdays, your Wednesdays, and your Thursdays. Typically, it's Tuesday mornings, Wednesday night, and Thursday mornings. Those are the three best times to send emails in our industry as of right now. That may change later, but as of April 1st, 2022, that's about what we're seeing. Um, let me see. Yes. A lot of you had gotten an email last night from uh, the Donahue group saying that they are closing. And if you recall, the Donahue group is where I highly suggest that we go to for our PCIP blocks, our um, library cataloging blocks. And they are closing. They will stop taking submissions the end of April, and then they will completely be closed as of May. They have recommended another company. I have not worked with them personally, and I have not researched them yet, but I'm going to. And I also have a call in with Pat, who who is, she is uh, Donahue Group. Um, Pat is the one, if you've ever dealt with Donahue, you've uh, either talked to either Pat or Tani. And so I have a call with Pat right after this, 11 o'clock. I'm gonna talk to her and see what's happening. So um, we'll see what comes of that. And it seems like they have definitely thought about this long and hard in 38 years in business. Man, don't they deserve a break. So I'm excited for their new chapter and to learn more from Pat, as well as to learn more about um, the new company that they are recommending. And I'll have more for you maybe next week. All right. Good morning. Two of my awesome author clients are having a devil of a time with Amazon. They publish using Ingram Spark. Their books keep showing up as sold out on Amazon when their sales aren't reflecting that. Also, they have had people order their books from Amazon and not receiving them. When I email Ingram Spark, they say, talk to Amazon. When I talk to Amazon, they say, talk to Ingram Spark. It's like parents saying, ask your mom or dad, uh, which is funny because my husband and I have a pact that we will never do that. Um, so, yes. 
if you are having problems, I'll tell you probably why. If people are ordering from Amazon and they're not getting their book, they need to complain directly to Amazon because most likely what has happened is they ordered from Amazon through a third party seller. Let's call it, um, I don't know, bookstore online. Let's keep it simple. So if the person is ordering from Amazon, but they're really buying from the third party bookstore online and bookstore online is not shipping that book, it's really on them. So technically it isn't Amazon or Ingram Spark who's not shipping the book. It is the third party. However, it does fall in Amazon's court. The way to get that handled though, is to have the customer complain about not receiving the shipment. And that goes to the bookstore online's Amazon's account and Amazon will then step in. And that is how it has to be handled because it's a third party. So that is why you may be getting the runaround there as far as people who haven't received books. If you have the information, if you have the receipt from the person who ordered the book, I strongly recommend that you take it to Amazon. You say, look, it's a, this third party because then Amazon does take steps for their third party sellers, people through Seller Central who are not actually delivering the product and it needs to be handled that way. But that doesn't help you with getting the book listed directly. So as far as Ingram Spark, distributing over to Amazon. It is something that should be done. However, it can take a month or more for them to sync up with metadata and for them to play nicely. So that is what often happens. And as far as being out of stock, sometimes Amazon will do that if they don't physically have books in their warehouse. It's not unusual for them to order a couple of books and keep them on the shelves if the book is selling so that they can then ship it out. So you have a little bit of everything going on, it sounds like. If possible, I highly recommend that you upload your book directly to KDP for Amazon sales. Um, I understand if it's a picture book or something and you don't have that option. But if you do, if it's a novel, if it's something that you could upload directly to KDP, I strongly recommend you do that. Use the same ISBN, the same interior. The only thing that's different is going to be your cover specs are going to be a little bit different. And so that is what I would recommend as kind of the, the hold off. Now, eventually, do you want it to work out? Yes, but you're basically asking two toddlers to play nice and they don't always listen. So unfortunately, that's what you run into. Um, I know, I know. Sorry if anyone from Ingram Spark or Amazon's listening in, but that's kind of what it's like. They don't like each other and it shows sometimes. And so We've got the two entities kind of doing this. If you can circumvent it, just go straight to Amazon, upload your book there for print on demand and move on. If you can't, you can still work at it, but you have to be going to Ingram Spark and asking if they have to push the distribution over. Once they confirm, you have to wait at least four weeks before you can go to Amazon and say, hey, this is happening. It takes a lot of legwork. No, we can't all just get along. Jeez, David. I was about to say I should slap you for that, but then I thought that was inappropriate. So I decided to just tell you about it instead of actually saying it. Um, so there we go. Um, look, I'm blushing. I don't know if you guys can tell I'm turning red. All right. And are these people who are third party selling, are they indie bookstores? In some cases, they're indie bookstores. In some cases, it's just someone who has a retail license who is ordering wholesale and selling uh, through their book depository is a big one that does it. Um, and these are not bad companies. There are some that don't go through, but there are a lot of legitimate companies. But book depository, sometimes you'll see like Abe's books or different things like that. They just have a seller central account on Amazon. It is often how people sell on Amazon. When you buy clothes on Amazon and things like that, Amazon did not produce and sell those. In most cases, it's coming from a third party seller through Seller Central, and that's what it is. So there's a couple bad apples, but they need to be reported on Amazon to do anything about it because that is a Seller Central issue. See, Randy, that's my trick. When I'm going to say something that I shouldn't, I'm like, well, I was going to do this, but I'm way too mature for that. So I'm not going to say it as I tell you what I was going to say. 
Oh man. Absolutely. You want to support the indie stores when possible, which is why I highly recommend using Ingram Spark. Get your book up onto Ingram Wholesale, and your book will generate over to IndieBound, to bookshop.org. Post those links on your website, post them on social media, and share so that you can direct people to the indie bookstores. That is a great way to support them. Um, and it's just a change out of a link or listing all of them. I recommend that when you have a website, list your book on Amazon, of course, because a lot of people buy from Amazon, but also list IndieBound and bookshop.org. Give them, give people that easy option to support Indie if they'd like. Not falling for that one, Teresa. Not falling for it. All right. And a question, would you say then if Donahue is closing that it's too late to send in a request this weekend? No, Teresa, it's not too late. Donahue Group is accepting PCIP requests through April 30th. So you can keep sending in, they will get those to you by May. So their plan is to take requests through April, they will fulfill requests through May, and then May is when they're absolutely positively done. So again, I'll have more information after I talk to Pat today. All right. Kim's question answered. Let me go over to my email. There we go. Um, a question I got recently was about library sales. You guys know I'm a big advocate of libraries and also authors selling into libraries. Libraries pay you for your book and then they market your book. They are constantly putting your book on their shelves and they are pulling in people. That is their job to pull people into the library. That is how they get their funding. So they are constantly pulling in customers and if your book's on the shelf, then you are being marketed. And certainly if you can tie into a, a local author wall or a certain season, um, Mother's Day is coming up. Do you have a book that could really be featured for Mother's Day? Take it to a library and ask if they would consider putting it on their display for Mother's Day, that kind of thing. And so I talk about libraries a lot. New Shelves does the library mailings where we actually market directly to libraries. And I do a lot of talks on libraries. And a question I got in recently was, great, you like libraries and I'm pitching libraries and my local libraries have said yes. However, a lot of libraries are saying that you must have a library card in the community in order to submit a request to stock a book. Kind of true. A lot of them, if you go online on their website request, they do require a library card and they make you input the number because they do like to give special consideration to local requests. That is true. However, if you have that and you're like, hey, I'm not local, you have a couple of options. Number one, do you know anyone local? Can you go find a friend or anything like that and say, hey, if you love me and you don't mind and you're going to the library anyway, would you put in a request for my book? It would mean a whole lot to me. And sometimes people will do it. Another thing you can do is if there's an online form that says you must have a library card, find the acquisition librarian and just email them directly. It's okay to pitch them. The worst they can do is say no. And we get told no all the time, especially as authors, as writers, we get no all the time or we get no response all the time. That is okay. Because if you don't send out that email, you never know. And sometimes you get a yes. So if you are working towards getting libraries or bookstores or anyone to carry your book, then don't be afraid to send out those pitch emails or to work with someone who will send out those pitch emails for you. Just because your book is seen doesn't mean that it'll be bought, but because it's seen, it means it can be bought. And that's what's most important. Exactly. And you do have to weed out the no's for a yes. You absolutely do because your book is not a great fit for everybody. Or maybe their shelves are just stacked full of self-help books and they're like, yeah, we don't really need that. I'm looking for kids lit right now. That's okay, but you got to put it out there. Make relationships, take a no 
gracefully. If someone says no, it's okay to say, you know what, thank you so much for that consideration. I appreciate your time and it's been wonderful meeting you. That is the right response. I saw someone I follow on Twitter today say that they had given a no and the email they woke up to this morning was F no uh, or F you, F you. Um, and so, yeah. That's not appropriate. That's not going to win you any friends in the community. It's not professional. I know it's email, but if you wouldn't say it to their face, please don't say it. And even if you would say that to their face, please don't say it. <laughs> um, so it's really important to take a no gracefully to learn how to do that. And yes, it's disheartening. It's disheartening when you don't get a yes, when you don't get the opportunity you wanted. But the attitude you have with a no will reflect in any future interaction you have or anything like that. Same here at New Shelves. I don't always get a yes when I pitch a client's book or when I ask for a review or when I send out a proposal. That's okay. It's all about the relationships that we have in how we present ourselves. Because as an author, you are a professional. And it's important that you act like one, even online, even in email, um, because that's kind of the world we live in today. So make sure that you take a note gracefully. It is okay if you are chatting. Let's say you go into a bookstore and you're chatting with them. And you say, you know, I was wondering if you'd consider my book. And they look up your book and they say, uh, I'm sorry, it's just not a good fit right now. It's okay if you're in that kind of environment to say, Thank you for your consideration. Is there any specific reason why or something I could work towards that would help? And sometimes they'll say, well, actually your book's not returnable or your book's not at the right discount or something like that. So you can get valuable feedback. You just have to know when to ask for feedback and when to say, thanks for your time and walk away. <laughs> Usually you get a vibe from people. And it's important how you present that request for feedback so that you don't appear pushy, but that you really truly are asking, hey, uh, you know, can you give me some advice because I appreciate your insights. It's all about delivery. All right, another question coming up here. I uh, have been told that a book signing at small country fairs might be a good idea. Is it? Some tiny fairs only charge maybe $25, but some are in the hundreds. But more people. It's confusing. Yes, it can all be uh, confusing, isn't it? Fairs, um, comic cons, all sorts of those things can be good places to sell books. It depends on your book, number one, and it also depends if you are willing to put in the time, because this is an instance where in most cases, it's not too terribly expensive. 25 bucks, I can probably afford that, but it usually means I'm there all day or I'm there for two days. So it's more of an investment of your time. If you're willing to go to hang out, to meet people, to chat, then it can be a great opportunity. In my experience, if you're going to basic fairs or farmer's markets, the things that do very well are giftable items, things that people tend to buy because they're looking for a gift or children's books because children's books are a, uh, uh, kid sees, we end up buying it. Don't know how that happens. I'll never forget the time that my husband and I went to a gun show in Virginia and came home with like a ring for my two-year-old, like a legitimate gold ring. Um, and so that that is the power of, of our little daughters on their daddies and our little boys on their moms is that they ask for things and we're like, yeah, of course we'll buy you that. And so that is the kind of thing that happens. And so uh, children's books do really well, giftable books. And sometimes if it is specific to the genre, if you have a romance book going to a fair or something that concentrates on romance, readers can be great. These are avid readers looking for new people to purchase from, especially if I've heard this again and again, if you are considering a local fair or anything like that, that features authors, if the headlining author is the same genre as you, that's when it's really smart to sign up because they're going to be pulling a big crowd who's already interested in your content. It's like when I say we need to target our uh, Facebook ads, 
Well, when the headliner is a great comp for your book or your series, you targeted your ad. So that's a really good investment. But in all things, it's so important to just realize it's to hang out. It's to talk to people, to network. And if you're willing to put that time investment in, then it can absolutely pay off. Um, but you've got to try it out. You've got to see what works for you and you know your book genre. So that's important as well. And you know how comfortable you are talking to people. You're going to put your books up and I've seen this. I have seen this. You're going to put your books up and you're just going to sit like this as people walk by and they come, they pick up your book and you're just like, guess what? They're going to be scared of you and they're going to run away pretty quickly. But if you are chatty and you're talking to them and you've got a little pile of candy for kids to come up and take, they are probably going to come talk to you. But you, in that case, are your own salesman. So you've got to sell. And that's not for everybody. Um, obviously, I can talk to anybody. I make friends in the grocery store, or at least I think we're friends. I don't know if they're just annoyed, but I make friends in the grocery store. My husband, on the other hand, Actually, he's super friendly, but if given a choice, he'd never talk to people outside of our house. Who could be annoyed by me? Oh, let me count the people. Um, we'll ask my husband about that one. God bless. <laughs> All right. Um, yes, I do pitch books. So new shelves, we do absolutely pitch books. We do it through our library mailings and our bookstore mailings. We pitch books that way. And occasionally, very occasionally, I take on longer projects where I pitch directly for um, reviews or different things like that. I do have clients that we work on a large scale where we create a custom marketing plan and we work together from anywhere from three months to a year. Um, that's actually not uncommon. It's just something we offer a wide variety of things where it's for the, the very budget conscious where we can get you out quickly and then we have bigger programs as well. We kind of work along the line because I think all authors deserve a chance and all authors deserve professional marketing help no matter where they are with their budget. So we try to accommodate all along the road. Sometimes that means I'm teaching you how to pitch yourself. And sometimes it means I'm pitching you. Just depends. I always say you've either got time or money if you want to really market your book. And which one are you going to invest? Yeah, the candy dish is a great idea. So when people browse, when they are in fairs and different things like that, think about it. You don't want to talk to the person selling because you don't want to get roped in, right? So you kind of stay a little bit back. But if they are doing a giveaway and you have to go up and sign something or put your name on the list or get a raffle ticket for that giveaway, you're going up to the table. Once you go up to the table, you're going to talk to them. Once you talk to them, they have a chance to sell to you. If you have candy or something like that that says take one especially if you have kids books well then kids are going to go up there and go and usually parents are going to go with them because you don't let your kids just go to a random table and take candy from strangers you have to go test it out first obviously and so yes whiskey shooters not sure you can give those away on a public fairground randy but you know your market. Uh, maybe this becomes something, you know, like those drink tester people who are in, in the liquor stores and stuff. Like maybe you just set up your books with your wine wares. That could work. Um, you have to think creatively to your market. Is it, um, what else could you give away? Yeah, bookmarks and stuff like that. But if they don't know you, do they really want your bookmark? Eh, who knows? However, do they want your, um, do they want your candy? Of course they do. Everyone wants candy. If you have a cookbook, do they want to see you making something on a hot pot? Do they want to have a sampling of your taco seasoning? Probably. So you have to think creatively about how it can fit with your book and make that your giveaway to draw people to the table. Because once you get them to your table, number one, they're going to take a closer look at what you're selling. And number two, you have a chance to talk to them. And when you talk to them is when you can sell if you're willing to sell yourself. Yes, drink tester people. Oh, they're tasters. Are they called tasters? No, because look, my blonde is showing, but they can't be called tasters because are they really? Because they set up tables and ask people to taste. 
I'm not sure how that works. It's guys, I've only had like that much of my coffee. I'm just going to stop where I'm ahead. Yes, the one drinking are tasters. The ones who are offering the tasting are pourers. Look, Tara, with all her knowledge, well, you could be a pourer, Randy, with your bar, with your bar books. Kids like stickers. That's a good one, Jane. I have had custom uh, stickers printed up very inexpensively at a local printer where we took the book cover and we took the book cover and we kind of made it a square. So obviously we cut parts off, but we made it a square. We made square stickers that then they took with them. Kids like it, which is awesome. Number two, when parents go home because you didn't buy the book or whatever it is, when parents go home, it's still a reminder of your name, what the book title is, all of those things. So that is a fun thing. Or you can just get generic stickers. Go buy a big roll at Walmart and give them away. Um, there is a reason why Walmart has been giving away those smiley face stickers for years because a little tiny one cent sticker makes people very happy. Um, I still do accept my stickers. Um, but I also like to chat with our greeters, so. Um, so I think that you just have to think creatively, whether it's online or in person, whether even if it's an author event in a bookstore, just because a bookstore says that you can come in and you can sign books or you can sell books there doesn't mean that people are going to stop and pay attention to you. You have to give them a reason. Yeah, they might browse around and yeah, they might naturally come stop by your table, but it helps when you have a reason and it helps if you're willing to sell, if you're willing to chat. If you really do not like people, which happens, if you really don't like people or if chatting is not your thing, then maybe it's an icebreaker. Maybe it's a reason so you feel more comfortable because it's like, oh yeah, sign up for this and I'm raffling off whatever it may be. Um, there are different things like that that you can do. I've done it. We're doing a bookstore event where we did a raffle and the raffle was a gift card to the bookstore we were at. So I already knew people shopped there. The bookstore was very happy and the bookstore delivered it because simply we said, all right, you won this big raffle, congratulations. And now you just have to go to the bookstore to the front desk to pick up your gift card. So I didn't have to like send anything, although I could have mailed it. Um, and that is how we collected names and email addresses and information for our mailing list for follow-up information. So you really do just have to think creatively. Yeah, I mean, it really is um, just like online. I say this all the time. You have to give people something they want. If you are giving away a short story or something like that, people have to want it. And, and I often say people don't want just a chapter anymore. They're not exchanging their email address for it. So you have to give them something they want, like a full short story or a bonus epilogue or something juicy. That is the same for in person. If you want people to sign up for your email list, sure, have your list out there and people can just sign up and they may be willing to do that. However, not that many. <laughs> so having a giveaway, having something where it's like, oh, sign, sign up for my newsletter and I'll be doing a raffle for this bookstore. That is how you get people in. Hacky sacks. We gave away hacky sacks bought from fairtrade.org when we were at shows. It was a huge hit and everyone at the show knew about our booth. That's so smart. And again, if that's your audience, um, I, anyone, anyone who grew up some time ago, I won't say exactly how long, but anyone who grew up in that era is going to be like, wow, hacky sacks. And anyone who's younger, who is like, I guess they're retrending and also they're fun. Hacky sacks are fun. Um, Yes, I did have multiple hacky sacks and I was terrible at it, but I still had them. I carried it like I was cool, um, but that's about as far as I got. Exactly. So I think, again, creative marketing, something that's nostalgic, something that's just fun. I mean, why do you think people print stuff on Frisbees? Because they're fun. Now a bit overused, but fun. I'm a big fan of branding chapstick. Why? Because a lot of people like chapstick, men and women, and chapstick is something you tend to hold on to and take around and use. You don't get home and go, oh, I don't really need that and throw it away. 
you throw it in your purse and then you use it and then you see it multiple times and then you take it out at the grocery store you put chapstick on and someone goes oh what brand is that you go oh no it's actually from this author that i follow see it's brilliant it's genius that's as far as I go. And so I think it's important that we brand that way. Randy, I would be going, you have bar poem books. I'd be going for koozies. Koozies are cheap. You can easily do them. You can brand them. Um, going for um, bottle openers would be smart for someone who's kind of branded in the drinking industry. Um, think about your audience, what they want and what they will use. So it's something they want or something they will use. Because if you don't use it, you throw it away. I cannot tell you how many times I have been to conferences. I feel like I should be whispering this because I might hurt people's feelings, but I can't tell you how many times I've gone to conferences and you get this big bag full of stuff, but it's stuff. It's bookmarks. It's I keep the pens usually, but there's bookmarks and there are little cards and things like that. Do I look at them sometimes? Yes. Do I keep them? No, because it's stuff. But if it's something I can use, then I keep it. Then I'm reminded every time I use it. Um, nail files are smart. Absolutely, because it's usable. Um, stress balls. I like that. Bob had a stress ball made and it was like a book and it had his book's name on the stress ball. And it was a book about stress. Not only was that a nice punny integration that I super liked, it was something that like it tied in and made me laugh and go, oh, wow, how clever. Look at that, Bob, being clever again. Um, candles are a good one. And you can really go in a range of budgets. I know that's always a big concern. It doesn't have to be expensive. It has to be targeted. For acting books, what can you do for giving away for acting books? Um, well, could it be something like um, a break a leg sticker that has your acting book on it? Could it be something... Um, I don't know, Mike, what kind of things do people bring to auditions that they may have? Is it a notebook? Is it a pen? Is it, um, you know, think about what your audience uses. And that is, this is the, the key to all marketing. You have to think of your user. What do they want? What are they using? And then you have to assimilate to them. You can't expect, well, I made these awesome bookmarks, so everyone's just going to have to love them. If it's historical fiction, could you do old school fans? Um, just because it ties in can be fun. If it is something that is, um, I believe, Eileen, you have an Irish theme. Could you do something like a Irish pastry, like cookies or something that you give away? Could you do something that is a old Irish recipe that perhaps shows up in your book. Um, yeah, there, I mean, that playbill, Tara's saying a playbill template for, a, or a frame with space for them to add their name, photo, and bio info. Absolutely. Or maybe it is a sample, like a fill-in resume or CV so that people can see it and get an idea of what you professionally think should be on there. And then they can make their own. Something that is useful. Get your CV template and land the gig every time. Again, it's all about what they need and all of that. Tie into your book, be creative, and all of that. And I will say that I did not too long ago, uh, it was a couple months ago, I did a um, poll in a very big reader group about um, book swag and what people like for book swag. And I could not believe how many people said they like wearable items that they will buy wearable items. So they probably, if they know the author more, they follow the brand more, but wearable items was big. So probably because they can use it. Socks, shirts, um, so, someone said sweatbands. I didn't know those were still in, but uh, next time I go to the gym, I'm gonna get my sweatband out. Um, giveaway for a book about death. 
Well, if it's a book about death, can you do something that is maybe that is a bookmark, but it's a bookmark with a prayer for grief or a, a mindfulness moment? Is it something where you could give away a handkerchief? Um, I don't know if it's a little too sad or not. Um, could you give worry stones? Those are people who are grieving tend to like fidgety things. Could you give away a worry stone or something? Um, think again out of the box and it doesn't have to be expensive. It just has to be targeted. You guys, you guys are terrible. Do not do a cough and stress ball. Um, however, think, think of, you know, the person who is there, what are they feeling? Do they need grounding? Do they need um, something for stress? Do they need, um, maybe it's tea, you know? Um, I have to say, I hate tea and I say it is coffee's sad cousin, sad watered down cousin even, but tea is very popular. I know I'm, I'm not the majority, but tea, could you give a specialized tea bag that is a hug and a cup? Uh, you know, sometimes we don't have friends around us, but a hug and a cup can comfort you. Um, different things like that. Yeah, golf tees, if it fits. Um, if it fits your story, sometimes it doesn't have to stick around. It just has to really, really fit. Um, so. I hope they cry. So, well, yes, if it is a book where, I mean, you give me the last song uh, by Nicholas Sparks, please give me some tissues. I did. I sobbed while I read that. I remember reading the last song the first time in my bed. I lived in North Carolina and literally sobbing. I wish I had tissues that night. Um, thanks, Nicholas Sparks. Let's see. Yes, Nicholas Sparks. He gets me. Actually, sometimes, sometimes I like his stuff and sometimes um, it's not my favorite. <laughs> well, you can love tea, my friend. More for you, less for me. Yes, I love it. And that is, again, I love that creativity because that's what stands out in all marketing, whether it be your graphics, you want it to be close enough to what people expect that they're, they feel comfortable accepting it or seeing it or clicking on it, but then you want it to be stand out enough that they, they remember it. And that is the key, especially if you're at a fair or something like that, where you are surrounded by other people with books. Um, can you, Depends on your level of comfort, but do you have characters in your book? Is your book set in um, the 1800s? Could you dress up as someone from the 1800s? Do you have a children's book? Could you dress up as your character? Could you do some type of slightly crazy tie-in? That's fun. Um, if you have something like that, if you have, maybe you have a historical fiction book and you have different um, historical pieces, like maybe your book talks about sword fighting and you've got an old sword, could you put it up there? All of that kind of things. Um, those are the kinds of things that people remember. And some people think you're crazy, um, but people think that anyway, so it's fine. Dress up as death. Well, you know, I'm sure you can find something. All right. Follow up on the Amazon quagmire. <laughs> um, my client asked if I put my book on KDP as a paperback, does that take away the one that is already on Amazon and those reviews? And does that interfere with what I have going on in Ingram Spark? So no, if you decide to use both Ingram Spark and KDP for your book, what happens is that KDP will front their book as the top seller. Ingram Spark is no longer the top seller and becomes one of the other sellers. So you do not lose your reviews. They merge with the KDP listing because it's the same ISBN. That's the big key. You have to have the same ISBN. So then they merge. You keep all of your reviews and your great things. And KDP, if you do not click expanded distribution, which I do not recommend for you, then 
KDP just sells on Amazon. That's it, just Amazon. And then Ingram Spark stays the same everywhere else. Barnes and Noble, um, bookshop.org, booksamillion.com, all of those places, they stay the same. So you don't have to worry about it in the least little bit. And that is why I recommend it so highly that you go to KDP just for Amazon. Amazon will treat you so much better when you use their platform. Although they probably deny that. Um, there definitely is a ease of use when you use KDP direct for Amazon sales. Uh, I see no personal downside other than if your printing is specialized and you cannot use KDP. Um, or of course your distribution isn't set up for that. You bet, Kim. All right, guys, we've got a little bit more time. Anyone have more questions? I mean, we can totally go back to our creative marketing and, and dressing up as characters, but if anyone has any more questions, we've got about 10 more minutes and I'm here to answer them. Um, I am excited. We're going into April, which by the way, is right near Easter. This is your last big push if you have children's books. Easter is one of the biggest book sales holidays for children's books. So if you have children's books, your last big push now, I'd recommend you get your ads all up. If you have books that you think would be a good fit for um, Mother's Day, Father's Day, grads, now is the time to start having those ready and out. It's too late to pitch bookstores for your Mother's Day stuff, but you might be able to squeak by in local stores with your Father's Day or grad stuff. Um, and graduations are coming back in a big way. We are starting to see more public graduations. And so I think we will see an uptick in graduation gifts because that's what happens when you're not going and there's no real graduation. It's, you know, it's not live. People just send cards with gift cards or money. But as people start to go back to graduations and graduation parties, they will want to either have a gift to give with that money or they will be giving a gift because they like it better and so it's a great opportunity for those of you who have anything that might fit in there um again mother's day father's day is coming up think ahead to your holidays and how that might fit in um i saw a really funny um i i saw a really funny post about it was a self-help book that deals with um, dealing with your emotions and anger. And they tied that into the recent uh, slap incident that was very viral. And so that was actually kind of funny, stood out. Um, what other holidays are coming up? Of course, we have July 4th. You have United States, um, America, historical fiction. That could be a really good tie-in um, if you've got that discount ebook all the way around that time. Think about it. Um, and just as we head into summer too, keep in mind, this is when a lot of teachers are making their summer reading list for kids. So if you have a children's book and you've been thinking that you would really like to work with schools or something like that, now's a great time to kind of get in there and see if it could be recommended reading, especially if you cover local history. Um, that definitely is a smart tie-in. We've seen Jane Wood, who has been with us here and um, is in our group has done that really well. Actually, when we went to go visit St. Augustine in Florida, not too long ago, my whole family went and I grabbed the St. Augustine book from Jane because she wrote this fun mystery, pirate mystery that's set in St. Augustine. And my son read it right before we went. And so he was so excited when we saw different things because there was a tie-in. It was, it's just so smart. Um, Another thing I've been hearing is Facebook ads is changing. I'm sure we have heard about that recently. Facebook ads has once again changed who we can target in the audience that we can kind of get out to. Um, it's not the end of the world. You can still target, you can still run Facebook ads. Facebook just occasionally will take out different audiences for one reason or another, either privacy or um, because they don't target those places anymore. And so if you go into your ads and your ad audiences, you may see something that says, um, it like shows up a warning. All that means is you need to go into your audience. You will find in your audience something, it's just like a blank. Um, when you choose the different places and things you'll target, there will be some that are blank. X out of them. 
just say, okay, eggs out and save. And your audience is still there. You'll just have a couple less. Now, if this does really affect you and you're seeing a lot less response or audience, then it's time to add new audience members. It's time to go back to your comps, to go back into the head of who's buying your book and where they hang out. That is something that I know sometimes we're like, well, I found my audience. I found my ad list. I found my keyword list and I'm good. I'm good. My ads work fantastically and I don't need to do anything else. But while I wish that were true, every once in a while, every three, four months, you do need to go in and you do need to add new keywords to your Amazon ads, new audience members to your Facebook ads, because things change and also comps change and what's new and trending changes. So you need to keep in mind that just because you found a really good ad set, either on social media or on Amazon or anywhere else, it's time every couple of months to go in and to get in there and creatively think, okay, is this still relevant? Are there new things or places that I could target? And are there other communities I should be a part of? And that is fantastic insight from Jane. Jane is saying many school budgets start July first. So media specialists start purchasing in July. That is great, which means that uh, I would imagine kind of towards the end of June is a great time to get in front of them and start chatting them up. Yes, national days are fun. There are so many, there's a holiday for every holiday. There's national coffee day and national pet day and probably national cat day, and national dog day and national hug your kid day. So those national holidays can be fun to tie into. Don't overdo it. But if you can find a couple that tie into your book, that's super fun. Yep, April 2nd is national peanut butter and jelly day, which will make my son Odin very happy. David's asking if anyone is attending IBPA University. I know we have a couple people here who are going live, David. I will be presenting virtually on April 21st. I believe Tara will be virtually as well. Um, I think Jane, Jane may be going in person. Um, she'll be speaking in Orlando. And I just found out I will be speaking at the Florida Author and Publisher Association in Orlando in July, which I'm very excited about. So if you're in Florida, there's a big conference going on in July and I would love to meet you. Or even if you're not going to the conference and you're in Florida, send me an email if I can. I'd love to meet you. It's always fun when I get to connect with people who we are with for so long. Is there a national box lunch day or maybe a national lunch day? That's kind of fun for Cheryl who has the box lunch lifestyle. See, there must be, go, go. Google is our friend. And so you can find almost anything on Google. I was, uh, that came up on TV the other day and it made me laugh. Google never forgets. And I say that all the time, I tell my kids this, Google and social media, they don't die. All right, you guys, I think we answered all the questions for today. It was fun brainstorming and thinking of new ways to market and to really have different things, to have different ideas for your marketing because that's what stands out. Don't let your marketing get stale. Don't let it get comfortable or boring. Think about who you're selling to and how you can reach them and how they find you. So get creative, get a little quirky, a little crazy. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But a lot of times I think you'll find that when you stand out, people notice you and not everyone's going to love it, but I bet that there is a lot of people who will. So I love you guys. It has been awesome. I will see you guys next Friday, 10 a.m. Eastern. If you have questions, just email them in, info at newshelves.com. And we'll see you next week. Bye, everybody.